By anatheism, I mean anatheism. Ana being the Greek word for again, or upwards, or even at times return. Um, Jared Manley Hopkins, the poet, had a phrase called aftering and aftering, which he said was a way of reflecting upon your experience as you wrote poetry, committed yourself to a deeper mode of expression. And Anna, in a way, is a Greek way of saying um, after and aftering. It's, it's what comes after theism and after atheism. And in a sense, <laughs> curiously, it's a retrieval, as Anna, of something that precedes both. So the space of openness, as um, William James once called it in the Varieties of Religious Experience, when you're open to crosswinds and cross-purposes and you have to choose between wagering on some higher ultimate purpose or not wagering on some higher ultimate purposes, that would be for me an anatheistic wager. Now let me tease out the phrase ana a little bit more. We have analogy, um, anagogy, uh, anamnetic from the Greek anamnesis, which is remembering. So in a way, ana has the notion of a re, hence the subtitle, returning. It's a turn which is a returning back to something after the event. And what you're going back to is not theism or atheism, but that which precedes the choice between them. It's the moment of choice. It's the moment of hovering, wondering, marveling, um, deciding. It's the indecision, doubt, uncertainty that precedes the decision. But it's not a non-committal indifference. Uh, it's a, uh, a, an instant of what Keats called negative capability. And again, he saw this as, as indispensable to a philosophical or a poetic position or disposition. It's the disposition before the position. Um, but it calls for a positioning. And he, de he described, that's Keats, described negative capability as finding yourself in a condition of doubt, uncertainty, and wonder without the irritable reaching for fact or proof. So it's that moment that Socrates uh, nominated as the fundamental initial inaugural moment of philosophy. It's that wonderment, the sense of Taumad Zain, of marveling, wondering, which then leads to the question, why is there something rather than nothing, which is said to be the fundamental question of all, of all Western philosophy. Why is there something rather than nothing? And then generally philosophers make a commitment one way or the other to nothing, and they become nihilists, or in the old Greek term, meontologists, meon, the believers in, in, in nothing. And then ontologists, those who believe in being. Why is there something rather than nothing? So there are different ways of, of answering this question. And Jean-Paul Sartre in 1943 uh, is still returning anamnetically to this inaugural moment of philosophy going back two and a half thousand years when he writes a book called Being and Nothingness. Now, if that's true of philosophy in that Socratic moment of what, what Socrates called not knowing, the first thing about philosophy is recognizing that you do not know anything. Then you can question. If you think you know, then there's nothing to question and there's nothing to answer. You've got it all from the beginning. You've got your dogmas, your doctrines, your certainties. Ditto for poetry, as we've just seen with Hopkins and with uh, Keats, the, 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 the moment of negative capability, which of course for Keats is a moment of not knowing, right, without that irritable reaching for fact and proof, but it then predisposes us to poetic invention. So the negative capability is conducive to positive capability and actuality if you follow the poetic wager. So we've said something about poetry, we've said something about philosophy, those inaugural moments that make both possible. Um, now let's come to religion, because the book is largely 
uh, the book and atheism is largely concerned with the question of religion and the crisis of religion in our times after the death of God, after Nietzsche, after uh, Freud, after Marx, after Feuerbach, after Sartre, after Russell, after all those great thinkers who said, no, it's all an illusion. So what anatheism is trying to suggest is that analogous to the poetic and philosophical inaugural moment of negative capability and wonderment, respectively, there is an inaugural moment at the root of all great wisdom traditions. And that usually takes the form of a narrative where someone, uh, retrospectively called a holy person, is summoned by a voice. And the religious moment comes in terms of the response to that voice. Three examples that I take in the opening chapter of <clears throat> anatheism are one, Abraham uh, being visited by the three strangers. So out of the desert come these three strangers. And Abraham's there with his wife Sarah, his slave mistress, Hagar, and um, he is basically doing what Abraham does in his tent in the middle of the desert. And these strangers, these three strangers appear from nowhere. And he doesn't know whether they're threatening outsiders and, and invading marauders, or whether they are people worthy of hospitality. So there is this moment of, of wondering, are they hostile or are they hospitable? Do they come to bring peace or violence? And of course, the root of hospitality and hostility is actually the same. Hostis and hospes in all the European, Indo-European languages, as Ben Venice points out, but also in Latin, uh, can mean either friend or enemy. They both have this root. Um, so this is his moment, uh, inaugural moment of, of decision. And he begins with indecision. He doesn't know. But then he makes a wager that these strangers are to be welcomed. And of course, this becomes a basis of the religious ethic of Judaism. Uh, we must care for the widow, the orphan, and the stranger. Um, so the, the stranger is welcomed by Abraham, and the impossible becomes possible. That is to say, Sarah, who is barren, conceives a child. And the child is Isaac, meaning laughter, because Sarah laughs when she hears that she's going to uh, become pregnant because it's impossible. And Isaac is, carries in his very name the impossibility of birth coming from non-birth. And that, if you like, is the miracle of the impossible becoming possible, which is the meaning of religion, that the impossible becomes possible. You even find it right down to the spiritual teaching of uh, AA, an addiction, that it is impossible to give up this addiction. And so you must acknowledge, first and foremost, your helplessness before this. Then there is the invocation of a higher power that will make possible that which is impossible. So again, that's, another, that's a contemporary resonance of this inaugural moment, because the inaugural moment does, doesn't just go back to Abraham. It's repeated again and again and again when anybody decides to make the impossible possible, to move mountains, to overcome an addiction to survive a major depression. Whatever seems impossible but then becomes possible would be possibilized, um, would enable the agent to, to, to become capable of, of this move by what I would call this, this, this uh, leap of faith. A second inaugural moment in Christianity is Mary uh, confronted by, accosted by, visited by, um, invaded by this stranger in her boudoir and who says, you know, do not be afraid because, of course, she's terrified. And she moves forward and she moves back. That's the inaugural moment. That's the anatheistic moment, the moment before theism or atheism because she can say no to the angel, and that's an atheistic response, or yes to the angel, and that's a theistic response. She could be wrong. I mean, she might be far better off to be atheistic in that regard and not believe this is the voice of God. How many people have heard voices of God that have said pretty awful things? Um, they would have been far better to have remained atheistic about it. But 
she responds corporally and um, cognitively to this. She's always shown with uh, reading, reading from a lectern. So it's not an uninformed wager. Uh, we don't know what she's reading in all these portraits we have from Botticelli to Raphael and so on, the great portraits of the Annunciation. We don't know what she's reading, but she's reading something, and probably the stories of Abraham receiving the strangers, Samson's mother receiving a call to have an impossible child, and she says yes, and Samson is born, etc., etc. The same phrases are used. Uh, that is to say, she is troubled and she ponders. And that, that defines the inaugural moment of all great religions. In Abraham, again with Mary, and subsequently with Muhammad, uh, she, she trembles because every angel is terrible, as Rilke says. You know, you just don't know this, who this invading power is. It could be God, it could be a rapist. There's no way of knowing. Just as the strangers in the desert, they could be God, or they could be, um, they could be murderers. You don't know. And you're opening your home in both cases. You're opening your body in both cases, Sarah and Mary, to, to this visitation of the stranger, of what the Greeks would call the dynam, uh, the terrifying otherness of, of, of the mystery of the divine. Now, Abraham, it turns out, made the, made the right choice, according to the biblical narrative, because the three strangers were God. And <clears throat> anticipate, of course, for Christians and, and Andrei Rublev in his great icon, the three persons of the Trinity or indeed the three wise kings. The, the visitation, the epiphany, is very often in the form of, of three. Three that then become one. Um, but in the instance, uh, just to repeat for a moment, of, of Mary's response to the call, there is a, uh, she is troubled, so there's a fear and trembling before, before this daunting and terrifying otherness. And secondly, there is, she ponders. And the pondering is what Ignatius would call, we're here at Boston College, um, uh, discernment, the discernment between spirits. So it's not some blind, irrational leap of faith. That's the problem with you know, Charlie Manson and Peter Sutliff and uh, Jack the Ripper, who think they hear a divine voice saying, go out and kill prostitutes or you know, kill your lover, kill your children, whatever it happens to be. Um, <clears throat> and we could get back to Abraham <laughs> on Mount Moriah, uh, listening to a voice that says, kill your son, and then another voice that says, don't kill your son. Now, that, that's an anatheistic wager. What do you do? Um, not easy. But in the case of Mary, she says yes to the stranger. She conceives of a child, and the child is called Emmanuel, the birth of Christianity. In Islam, I won't, I won't delay on that, but, but it's a third very important narrative that I go into in the book also, where Muhammad in, in the cave, after much fasting and, and, and prayer and so on, in the middle of the night is seized by this presence and he's torn apart and the language is very, is very terrifying. And no doubt he is troubled and ponders. And in his being troubled, torn apart as he puts it, as he sweats in the cave, um, and then thinks about it, thinks about what? Thinks about Abraham, thinks about Jesus, both of whom and, and Miriam, as, as she is called in the, Joshua and Miriam, as they're called in the Quran. Um, he reckons, he discerns this as, as a holy voice. And so uh, he listens to the voice and it becomes Islam. Uh, in time it becomes Islam. So in the three inaugural moments of monotheism, now we could go into other religions too, we don't have time, and in the book I don't, I, I declare my lack of expertise and competence to take on other religions. Uh, but I do argue that anatheism must be interreligious and must listen to the stories of Buddha and the stories of Shiva and Krishna and, and so on if it is to be truly open to um, what I call a hermeneutic of interpretation, of listening. Because the voice comes in many ways. Uh, the holy manifests itself in many ways. Um, the angels, uh, Angel Gabriel, for example, is a key figure in Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Um, and the Sufis, who were, in, who were very much in dialogue with the Persian Zoroastrians and the uh, Hindus and the Buddhists, 
they talked about the imaginal as this realm where the divine manifests itself in the form of what we call angels, these strangers that hover between the invisible and the visible. So that realm of the imaginal is where anatheism takes its stand or takes place. And to come back to the term, what I'm suggesting is that today in our contemporary world, there's a crisis of culture, there's a crisis of religion, there's a crisis of belief, there's a crisis of values. And I call it an anatheistic moment because at one level, taking Anna as after, the aftering and aftering, as Hopkins puts it, it's a reflection on theism and an invitation to retrieve all that is enabling in theism, all that is a committed openness to the stranger. In other words, all that is hospitable in theism or more particularly in, in the tradition I deal with in the book, but not exclusively, monotheism. Hospitality is the root value and virtue and inaugural wager of the three monotheistic religions. And I also believe Hinduism and Buddhism, but we'll put that in parenthesis for now. So anatheism is the moment that tries to, where we find ourselves today, return to and retrieve what is enabling in this tradition of hospitality, although covered up, many would say, by doctrines and dog dogmas and ideological constructs and so on, which gave rise to crusades and inquisitions and with hunting and, and religious wars and, and so on. But beneath all that, there is this wager that we make that there is an underlying wager of hospitality. We wager on the wager. But it's also, as Anna, something that comes after atheism. Atheism understood not as a moment of not knowing, sort of agnostic atheism, because anatheism requires that uh, in all of us, not just in history, i.e. Marx, Nietzsche, and Freud. We need that. We need them. Um, but also as a moment in each of our lives. We all undergo moments of agnostic atheism when we just don't know anymore. We're depressed. We're despondent. We're bored. We're living what Heidegger and the existentialists would call, you know, angst, angoisse, anxiety, dread. Nobody has not experienced that, waking in the middle of the night and saying, what's it all about? That's the moment of not knowing, of agnostic atheism. So anatheism comes after that moment, personal and historical, of atheistic agnostic not knowing, which I would kind of call positive atheism. Um, and likewise, positive theism. But it also requires critically an interrogation and indeed a deconstruction of what I would call negative atheism, which is militant exclusive humanism, that there's nothing beyond the purely material, um, finite human world. And secondly, uh, what I would call dogmatic theism, so or negative theism. So anatheism is an attempt to deconstruct negative atheism in order to retrieve positive atheism, um, the undoing and dismantling of idols and dogmatisms. And on the other hand, it's an attempt to deconstruct negative uh, theism, dogmatic theism, in order to retrieve positive theism. So to sum up, anatheism is both an historical moment now in our contemporary 21st century, third millennium. It's a moment of response to a crisis in religion, um, a crisis in our spiritual culture, because some people declare themselves spiritual and not religious. So I want to take it in the broadest sense. We don't know what's sacred or not sacred anymore. So the anatheistic moment is a moment of not knowing, which then returns to God after God. And that is a call for a creative, an ethical, a poetical, um, constructive returning to what was before dogmatic theism and militant atheism, and indeed what was before the institutionalizing of all great religions, i.e. the inaugural moment of not knowing 
which then gave rise to a wager on hospitality over hostility towards a stranger. The book is essentially an academic book written uh, for, I would say, a general educated, interested audience. But it's published by University Press, Columbia University Press. So, you know, it is 40 pages of footnotes. But I've tried to write it um, in a narrative style. I begin by telling my own story of going through kind of a basic a childlike uh, theism through uh, a moment of agnosticism and atheism in the 60s and 70s, and then returning to, uh, in this anatheistic, anamnetic way, uh, some embrace of the sacred and the spiritual and the religious in a post-religious, post-secular culture. Um, and that narrative is a way of inviting the reader in. Uh, I, I don't use words like phenomenology or hermeneutics um, or eschatology or ontology. That comes later and generally more in the footnotes than in the text itself. And then throughout the book, I tried to work with stories. I, I mentioned earlier the story of Abraham and the strangers, Mary and the stranger, and then Muhammad and the stranger. But as the book progresses, I also um, take numerous examples from writers. Uh, I see Joyce as an anatheist uh, who goes through atheism and retrieves uh, some deep sense of the spiritual and the mystical. Uh, likewise, Virginia Woolf um, into the lighthouse. I do a reading of that. And then Proust, Remembrance of Things Past. I take those as three paradigmatic cases of anatheistic writers. And then I look at politics and uh, the contemporary political debates on religious pluralism, the culture wars, um, liberalism, communitarianism, uh, the question of Islam and identity, minority uh, rights in that regard, how, how our Western civilization in Europe and America um, is faced with this wager of hospitality towards the so-called unknown, potentially menacing, potentially enabling and affirming religion within monotheism that has been marginalized historically and that now is reclaiming its place, as it were, at the center of the, of, of, of the religious culture that still exists in the West. And indeed of the secular culture, which you might even say is more dominant than the religious, particularly in Europe, maybe not so much in America, where I think 90% 90, 90 of people still say they believe in a God. Um, but nonetheless, that issue of how the religions interact with each other in our modern secular, post-secular world, and indeed interreligiously, as our English-speaking world, our, our, our Western Atlantic uh, universe opens up to the other continents. So there is there are one or two chapters on that. And then I take a number of examples of, of people who I see as anatheistic, holy people. Uh, three examples I take in, in the last chapter are um, Dorothy Day, the founder of the Catholic Worker, um, and the hospitality houses throughout the United States to welcome down and outs, drug addicts, um, delinquents. Uh, dispossessed, disinherited people. Uh, then Jean Vanier, who founded the founded L'Arche, the L'Arche communities, I think there are 300 now throughout the world in different continents, which again began with something very simple, a, a hospitality house, an arc, L'Arche in French, which receives disabled people, uh, mentally and physically, who, who find no place in society and are usually institutionalized. Very radical movement. And he, at the moment, is being proposed for a Nobel Peace Prize. And then, uh, thirdly, I take Gandhi, a surprise to no one, I suppose. But again, somebody who was able to retrieve the spiritual and the religious uh, in a political context of resistance and um, uh, independence in terms of the Indian struggle. So there are three individual narratives that I um, retrieve and retell as a exemplary figures of anatheism. So whether it's, you know, 
contemporary saints, or modern saints, if I can put it like that, the, the stories of modern saints, the story of modern politics, the politics of tolerance and intolerance, or the aesthetics of anatheism in, in, uh, in fiction, in, in modern fiction, Joyce Proust and Virginia Woolf. These are all attempts to exemplify the three main stories of the inaugural moment of anatheism in Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Well, I think for many people, the literary imagination is very important because since Matthew Arnold, the great book in the, the end of the 19th century, uh, Culture and Anarchy, culture, and perhaps most importantly literature, has become a surrogate form of spirituality. Those who could no longer believe in the old uh, traditional views of God as the, you know, the, the, the judge who punishes and, and rewards or the clock maker who winds up the universe and watches it unfold, um, justifies evil acts as part of a hidden providence and so on. People who no longer believe in that are the old superstitions and the old um, illusions, as it were, the infantile illusions of, of religion, nonetheless seek some surrogate form of religion and spirituality, and indeed the sacred. And they've often looked to literature, and in particularly spiritual kind of literature. So culture becomes the alternative to anarchy. Before it was religion, now it becomes sort of a post-religious culture, spiritual culture. And many people who call themselves spiritual but not religious will, if asked, um, to, to, to substantiate what they mean by spirituality. They say, well, you know, I go to yoga and I try to look after my health. You know, it's not just about biochemistry, it's about energies and chakras. You know, this kind of new age spirituality, if you will. Many people will, will talk about the sense of the sublime and the beautiful that they experience when, when going to see works of art or reading great works of literature, Dostoevsky, Tolstoy, Proust, whatever, or indeed visiting cathedrals and temples and mosques, but not because they happen to be you know, is Muslims, Jews, or Christians. They may hail from those traditions, but because they, they know there is something, uh, there is a sense of the sacred, even though it's lived aesthetically and spiritually rather than religiously, that is to be located in these places. So the literary or the aesthetic imagination is still something that I would call sacramental, in that it is looking for something sacred in specific stories, texts, people, Martin Luther King, Mandela, whether you happen to be a Christian or religious or not, there's a sense that these are holy people. Um, uh, so certain sacred places, certain sacred people, certain sacred stories, even in this post-religious, post-secular world. And that's what I would call, broadly speaking, the sacramental imagination, which is very often synonymous with the literary imagination. What I'm talking about in anatheism is a retrieval of that mystical moment of not knowing, the docta ignorantia, the, 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 the teaching of not knowing, as Kuzan, as a great mystic, put it. Eckhart says, you know, I pray to God to rid me of God. In other words, to bring me into the space of non-being, where I can then look to the God beyond being. So it is this mystical moment in St. John of the Cross, Meister Eckhart, Teresa of Villa, um, of, of letting go, Silesius, Angelus Silesius, of our certainties. And in this space of sort of evacuation, uh, of openness, uh, receiving uh, the stranger in you. So yes, it is, it is that moment of apophatic negative theology, which for me is the opposite of negative theism, um, but it's very close to negative capability. So um, we don't want to confound the terms negative here because they mean very different things. In fact, for me, negative theology or apophatic mystical theology would be, for me, what I would call positive theism. Uh, perhaps I shouldn't have used the word negative theism. I don't actually in the book. I talk about dogmatic theism and I talk about militant atheism. But uh, yes, uh, certainly the mystical moment is the moment of Abraham, Mary, and Muhammad. They, they are mystical moments which are then repeated throughout sacred history by the great mystics, by the great saints, and I would say by many, many ordinary people like you and me or anybody else who is not a saint or a great mystic but has those mystical moments. And uh, when we look at literature, I mean, Vir Virginia Woolf, Proust, and Joyce all had a sense of the mystical that, that informs their writing, even though none of them would have called themselves theists or atheists. It's 
it's interesting. They, they hover between that space. Um, but there is, just to complicate things, there is um, what I would call anatheistic atheism and anatheistic theism. And I suppose I myself would call myself, if I had to, an anatheistic theist. But there are some people, like James Joyce, who would call himself, if he had to call himself anything, he would no doubt resist the labels, uh, I think an anatheist uh, atheist. In other words, atheism, the not knowing taking precedence over, over faith, a faith claim. But in the not knowing, in that anatheistic atheism, Joyce would have been, and always was, fascinated by mystics, fascinated by epiphanies. I mean, the term he chooses to describe the great literary aesthetic moments of illumination are epiphanies. Where does he take that? He takes it from the Feast of the Epiphany. So it's not just a secularization of the sacred. It's also a sense that the sacred is in and through the secular and the profane. And at that point, you know, anatheism has one foot in atheism and one foot in theism. And there can be all kinds of crossovers between the two. And indeed, isn't it Jacques Derrida who said in his little book on the name, and he himself says, I rightly pass for an atheist, so I would call Derrida an, an anatheist atheist. But he, he points out that in, in, throughout history, there has been a very, very close link between mysticism and atheism. And all the great mystics, almost without exception, have been accused of atheism at some point or other. So yesterday's atheism can become today's theism, and today's atheism may well become tomorrow's theism. And anatheism is what keeps the whole thing moving.